right, so we've got our first panel up here and we're kicking off a must-see conversation. Dirt is good, resilience as a key success driver. They're gonna explore the link between resilience and success in life, sports, and business. So please help us in joining, and joining us right now, help us welcome legendary left back, Roberto Carlos, <laughs> Vice President of Marketing for Unilever, Tati Lindbergh, and legendary tennis coach of Serena Williams and Holger Room, Patrick Motomabu. Moderating this discussion is executive editor of Adweek, Jameson Flemings. So please welcome to the stage, greatness. All right, what a way to kick off Stagwell Sport Beach. Welcome, everybody. I'm Jameson Fleming, the executive editor of Ad Week, and we've got a great conversation for everybody here today. And so we'll just start off with a brief overview of the campaign that led us here today. So Tati, walk us through what is Dirt is Good and why is it so important to just advertising history and what you've done at Unilever? Thank you. So first of all, some of you might be wondering what is Dirt is Good? Dirt is Good is a tagline, a brand idea, but it's the largest laundry brand in the world. So for the ones living in the UK, it's called Pursue. For the ones living in Brazil, China, Vietnam, all countries in Africa would be called Omo. So it's basically a laundry brand. And the idea of Dirt is Good was created 20 years ago. And it's all about flipping the idea that dirt, instead of being an enemy, is an ally. So up until the time that Dirt is Good was created, every single laundry advertising was showing that dirt is something that we should avoid. And we came up with the idea that you have to embrace dirt because it's through the process of getting dirty that we can be more creative, that we can learn values, we can help society, help the planet, and be more resilient. So reason why we are here today. So tell me, what is the one ad within this campaign that you feel like best exemplifies everything we're talking about here today? The latest. So for the ones who want to check at the Palais, we have one uh, ad called The Autograph, which is shortlisted now uh, in entertainment for sports. And it shows the story of this kid who desperately wants to get a autograph by Bukayo Saka. And it's beautiful because we place the product in a very nice way. So basically, the boy gets the autograph, but his parents wash it with Dutch is good. And he gets devastated, pissed off, and he then goes through, a, goes through a journey to get the autograph back. So that's the latest one, the autograph with uh, Bukayo Saka and Arsenal. Awesome. And so, Patrick, we'll start with you talking resilience. As a coach to many young players, as a mentor to many young up-and-coming tennis players, when you think about resilience, in tennis, if you have a bad day, a bad first set, you've got to bounce back immediately. This isn't like a team sport where you're best of seven and you can throw away a game and come back and win the next four. You've got to get your stuff together immediately. So how do you work with your your students and coach or uh, players that you mentor to make sure that if they have a bad first set, they're not done for the day and they're not out of the tournament. Hi, everyone. Thank you for that question. Um, the great thing with tennis is that um, it's all about resilience. If you look at the best players in the world, they play well less than 10% of the time, which means that they play badly or average 90% of the time. So. If you don't understand that, you get pissed. And most of the people that are not professionals, they, if, you look, <laughs> if you look at them in the clubs playing tennis, they're always frustrated because they expect to play well. And this is all about the, the philosophy of tennis is not about playing well. It's about finding a way with what you have. So this is, this is all about resilience. Um, it's frustrating not to be able to achieve at least what you think you should be able to achieve, but this is what tennis is about. Um, it's probably not the only sport like that, but it's one of the toughest sports for that, I think. Um, you know, again, you play well, maybe great, five times a year, even if, even if you play matches one day out of two. C can you imagine? So players, young players need to learn that this sport is not about looking good, playing good, 
having good sensations or feeling, but it's about finding a way with what you have. And I think that's the best definition of what resilience is. So we teach them that from a very early age. And a lot of professionals don't even understand that. And if you listen to what they say during the matches, a lot of them say, I don't feel the ball today. I don't do this. I don't do that. Yeah. But you have to find a way. <laughs> yeah. No, working with what you have is such a, an important thing to remember because I think a lot of the marketers in the audience here, you know, are probably short staffed and are trying to think, how do we work with what we have? And so it's a, a good thing to remember. And, you know, when you were younger, you dealt with a lot of anxiety and, and struggling to want, you know, how to talk with your peers. And, you know, here you are coaching uh, people, you're on stage, you do events. So how did you kind of have that breakthrough that allowed you to kind of break out of, uh, you know, your childhood and into, you know, kind of your professional career here? Yeah, that's true. When I was a teenager, I mean, from, from very young to being a teenager, I was not even able to talk to any one of you. No chance. I, my, I was scared all day that someone would talk to me. That was my, I would panic straight away. Uh, so it was a long way from where I was to where I am now. Uh, I think it's mostly decisions. And I think that the only way to progress in life is to take small decisions get the result of it and building your confidence out of, uh, out of every step you make. It's not from one day to another, of course. Uh, so I did, uh, I did take a lot of decisions. The first one was to go see a psychologist, uh, do a psychotherapy, which I did for 10 years when I was 17. Because I thought, I'm not going to live my life like that. My life is going to be a disaster. And, um, and I think it's all about the mindset, nothing else. When you are ready for life because you have the right mindset, you can achieve anything. And when I was 17, I was ready to achieve nothing. I, was, I had no chance to achieve anything. But these small decisions led me to the next stage and then the next stage and then the next stage. And when I was 26, I was ready. And when people ask me what am I the most proud of, any of my achievement, I always say this one, to change that 17-year-old into uh, that was unable to do anything in life into a 26 who was ready to kill it, because I was. And I knew nothing would stop me unless my, myself. So that's the, that's the big thing, to, to be ready. To be ready means um, having a strong drive, having a passion, uh, being able to un interact with people, which is a key in life. Uh, and all those things I was not able to do. Again, I did it step by step. And that's what I'm doing with my players. Of course, not, not my players are not as bad as me. <laughs> but I was so bad that I, I can help them. Yeah, it's, it's great to, to remember that, you know, at any point you can take control of your life and, and take the steps you need. And so for Roberto, Roberto, in the, the beginning part of your career when you were younger, you really broke the mold. Uh, for anybody not familiar, Roberto is arguably the most offensive minder uh, left back in the history of soccer, broke the mold, completely changed the way soccer was played. But when you break the mold, that comes with having to tra stay true to your skills because you're going to have coaches that aren't going to want you to do that and also face criticism. So how, as a young player, did you prepare yourself mentally to kind of break that mold and stay true to who you were as an athlete? Primero, pedir disculpas por no hablar por inglés, ¿está? He just wants to start off saying, I'm sorry for not <laughs> speaking in English, so he's going to be speaking in Portuguese. Eu queria, eu queria ser jogador de futebol. A minha ideia um dia era de representar o meu país. Comecei muito novo, com 13 anos. He always wanted to be a football player, a soccer player. Um, he started very young, when he was 13. But his, um, his dream was to be able to represent his country, Brazil, one day. Foram 27 anos jogando futebol, aprendendo muito dentro dos clubes que eu joguei. It was 27 years playing football. And uh, he, he did learn a lot through his whole career. Tive a sorte de jogar com os melhores jogadores do mundo. He was very lucky to be able to play against and with one of the best players in the world. De ganhar as melhores competições, as mais importantes. And win the Champions. most important um, trophies, this is Champions League and World Cup. Não foi nada fácil. It wasn't easy. Mas a vida de um jogador de futebol, você vai crescendo por treinos, por temporada, enfim. 
but it, the, the life of a, an athlete, that's how it is. You just have to be persistent and keep training and practicing, and then one day you'll get there. Mas todos os meus sonhos foram realizados. But all of his dreams came true. Um deles, claro, um, o gol contra a França. One of them, of course, is his goal against France. Desculpa. Sorry. <laughs> Desculpa, meu amigo Fabian Bartes. Sorry for my friend Fabian Bartes. Mas esse gol mudou minha história, né? But this goal really changed my life. É como um saque com efeito. Just like a, yeah, just like in tennis when it's it's good. Então tem que ter um pouco de sorte e qualidade para para conseguir os objetivos. You just need to luck, of course, but a lot of um, persistence. And in, in your career, and I think everybody can relate to this at some point in your career, is you probably had a manager or you worked for an organization that didn't know how to best use your skills, and it probably drove you nuts figuring out where you fit within an organization, and that's something you dealt with with your career is multiple times you landed on teams that tried to make you fit into their system instead of making their system fit you. And so how did you deal with those moments where the team would not build around your skills? His only main issue was in, was in Italy, that he had a little bit of difficulty. He started as a left back, and then he just finished as a forward. Por isso que o Real Madrid me contratou. And that's, that's why he went to Real Madrid. <laughs> Mas eu mudava, eu fazia com que os treinadores entendessem a minha forma de jogar. He used to make the, the managers understand the way that he used to play. E me ajudaram muito para que eu pudesse ser um dos melhores jogadores da minha posição. And they all helped me to be one of the best ones in my position. Porque tem o Maldini, tem o Marcelo, tem todos antes de there's mim. There's Maldini, Marcelo, and there's a lot of, <laughs> yeah. a lot of names out there. Obrigado. Mas é, foram 27 anos de muito aprendizagem e, e os treinadores me fizeram ser um bom jogador e por isso que eu consegui fazer uma história bonita no futebol. It was 27 years of learning a lot and of course if he had difficulty or not, or not all of the managers just helped him become the player that he was. Porque para você ser bom, tem que ter bons treinadores, né? And for you to have success and for you to do well and be good, you have to have good managers. <laughs> é verdade? Perfect segue back to Patrick. Uh, I want to I want to talk about a, a specific moment in your coaching career. Uh, a few years into working with Serena, and she's very sick at one of the major opens, and she's getting sicker with each round. Yet she pulls through and she wins the whole damn thing. So as you worked with her through that whole tournament. What were you drilling in her head for her to stay mentally tough as she felt worse and worse with each round? Well, that's one of the most impressive achievements I've ever seen in my life. Uh, I didn't think it would be possible, and I think that's the great lesson with those champions that are real exceptions, is that what you think is possible, you have to forget about it. You, because we all set limits, even if we don't want to, but we do. And when we set limits, we limit people. Uh, if, I w if she would have read my mind, she would probably never have achieved what she did because I thought it was impossible. She couldn't even get out of bed. She was 40 degrees fever. Um, I remember one day I, t I told her, let's go at least have a walk in the street. She stood up, she couldn't, she went back to bed. And uh, it was during Rangaros, 2015. And <coughs> every day, she couldn't go to practice. She, sta she was staying in the bed all day, just going out to play the match. Couldn't warm up before the match. Losing the first set because she was completely unable to play. And then something inside her was just refusing to lose. And she was able to win the second and the third set. After the match, I know that because I had some friends in the locker room, in the women's locker room. I'm not going there. So... I know she was laying down and, and literally crying for an hour because she was, she was just, she went all the way and, and then going back to bed. And um, of course, I never thought she could win because 
I thought I never thought she could play. <laughs> so I'm not even talking about winning. And she made it. And I always say that these incredible champions, their reality becomes their reality. The reality that we see is not their reality. They have a different one. And the way they see it, it happens. They make it happen. To go from, to go from one incredible achievement to another, you've already referenced your free kick against France. But it's common for athletes sometimes to have that incredible achievement and, and chase having another one. And so was there ever a point after that kick where you kind of struggle to think like, am I ever going to have another moment like that? Because it is arguably the greatest free kick in the history of football. And that puts a lot of pressure on yourself when you have that moment to duplicate it in the future. So did you ever struggle with you know, asking yourself, am I ever going to get back to that and do something like that again? Mas, né, mas eu treinava muito. Eu treinava, eu era insistente. Todos os dias eu treinava muito. I insisted a lot, so I tried to, to practice and train that same movement tinha, every time after. Eu practice. tinha mais facilidade com a parte interna do pé. I had a, I had a, a it was easy for me to use the inside of the foot. O frontal. Mas a, a parte exterior, nos treinamentos me saíam todas fora. Yeah, during practice, he said every time that he would try, it would all go outside of the goal. He would never actually score. E a única que o gol and the one time that he finally scored <laughs> was that one against France. Mas é, é, é muito treinamento, é muita insistência, é errar e, e melhorar. E essa é a vida de um, de um esportista. It's just a lot of training at the end of the day, many, many times, many errors, and then eventually you get it right. And he was lucky enough to do it in an important game. Mas muitas pessoas me perguntam como que eu fiz. Well, a lot of people ask, ask him, how did, did he do it? Não sei. He doesn't know. The wind. <laughs> Não sei. É treino. Fala, fala treino. Practice makes perfect. <laughs> uh, a, a perfect... It's perfectly said. Uh, Tati, you're not going to get off the hook with your most resilient moments here. So I want you, thinking about your career uh, as a marketer, what's a moment as you've grown in your career where you really had to bounce back from something, a decision you made, a campaign you executed that maybe didn't resonate as much as it hoped to? What's a message that you have for you know, a marketing and advertising audience of, of a moment they can learn from from you? Well, uh, I will not refer a campaign. I think I, I owe to all the moms here to say that uh, motherhood, I think, was the moment that I have to be more resilient and try to understand how to be a marketer, uh, remain successful, but at the same time having a child. And also now my son is, uh, will be 12 in two weeks. And uh, I think seeing how to help him to become an, a resilient adult is really, really important. And one of the reasons that I embrace wholeheartedly the whole idea of dirt is good and resilience and hearing these guys here is the importance of uh, us uh, really position ourselves in a world in a way that we don't give up. Because it's so easy now to give up and to just say it didn't work. Even here, I think for the ones who have campaigns, who are shortlisted or not shortlisted or might or might not win an award, this idea of bouncing back, I think what Roberto was referring to in terms of to get that free kick, the incredible one, that were potentially like a hundred times that he got it wrong. And that's how I feel as well. I think trying to manage our lives, whether you are a mom or not, but trying to just make sure that we wake up each day and we can do it slightly better than before. With whatever we do, I think sports just makes it easier for us to grasp and understand. But honestly, it's universal. The same idea of dreaming, daring, trying, and bouncing back whenever whatever life, uh, life uh, throws at you. So I think the journey to motherhood is where I have to be most resilient. Then work is work. We just figure it out. Amazing. And uh, 
with Roberto, I think every marker in the room can empathize with the idea of sometimes you need to take risks and, and push the envelope. And for you and the, your style of play, you took a lot of risks being so offensive minded. And I read stories from your playing days uh, from journalists that you know, could be critical at times because sometimes it left your team a little vulnerable defensively. And so how did you balance taking risks, knowing that if the risk didn't pay off, you possibly exposed your team to an opportunity the other way? No, I was playing a lot without ball. Eu jogava praticamente sem bola o jogo inteiro. Então eu sabia exatamente o momento de atacar e o momento de defender. The thing is that he used to play a lot without the ball. So whenever he had the ball, he knew exactly what was going on on the field. So he knew when to go forward, when to attack, or when to come back and defend. Eu não tinha, eu não tinha habilidade que tinha o Marcelo, por exemplo, não? Então, eu preferia muitas vezes jogar sem bola, dar o passe, ou fazer o sprint e voltar para marcar. Ou seja, eu me adaptava muito ao time contrário. Eu he conseguia ler o jogo. Eu li o jogo com muita facilidade. Ele não tinha realmente as habilidades. Ele mencionou o Marcelo. Então, para ele, era mais o sprint e a velocidade. Então, ele lia o jogo muito bem quando ele não estava com a bola. Então, quando ele tinha, ele sabia exatamente o que fazer e onde ir. Eu tinha uma meta para o jogo de fazer 11 quilômetros. His goal in a in a match was to do 11 kilometers in the game. Então eu procurava participar muito do jogo para dar passes de gols e fazer gols. So he he focused on participating a lot and the main thing for him was to give the assist or to give the pass and help scoring the goal. E quando tinha a bola nas costas, eu tinha um zagueiro e o meio campo para fazer cobertura. Então eu voltava mais pelo meio e não em linha reta. And and of course when he tried to when he went for the risk, he, had, he knew that he had people behind him to, to defend. So he never used to come back through, like in a straight line, he would go in the middle to help out. Por isso que eu tenho muito amigos no futebol. That's why he has a lot of friends in football, because they had to look out for him Todos all the time. Por mim. They would all run for him. So basically make sure your coworkers, your teammates have your back and they trust you. Uh, Patrick, with, with all of the players you have coached over the years, is there one that stands out to you, other than Serena, who we've already talked about, that really embodied this ability to just bounce back and take blow after blow and come back and still come out on top? Uh, probably, I mean, I think Serena is the best example. Uh, but if I have to take another one, I would say uh, Simona Halep. I think uh, for her, everything was difficult. She was small, uh, didn't have power. So at the start of her career, from the start, nobody was b believing that she could make it as a champion, uh, which is, a, in a way, a good start because you know you have everything to prove, and you, it's it's a good way to develop this resilience that we're talking about. And uh, she had so many injuries in her career. She had so many setbacks. Uh, again, nobody was believing. So everybody, every time she had a setback, everybody said she was done. So I think, yeah, she's a, she's a very good example of that. But most of the champions have gone through this. We have the exception with the three bigger ones. Uh, that, I mean, I think Rafa is a, also a great example. I didn't work with him. But if you look at all the injuries he's had in his career, that's, that's unbelievable. Um, and many times everybody counted him out because of his injuries. So I think all the champions have developed this incredible quality of resilience because otherwise they wouldn't be champions. It's as simple as that. Sure. And when you, you think about the future and you're, you're scouting players to bring into your academy, is there a spe specific attribute or something that kind of keys off to you that like, you know, this 8, 10, 12 year old who you're looking to bring into your academy, you can see in them like, this is a kid who's going to have that X factor to be able to bounce back. Yeah, sure. So, so a big part of my job is to scout the young players and, and see the ones that I think have a big potential. I scouted Coco Goff when she was 10, for example. Uh, which is a good example because Stan is very young, but for me it was obvious that she would become great. 
Um, I look at three major elements, uh, but the most important one is the mindset. Out of the three, th I mean, of course, the physicality, because it's a sport, so I look at how athletic people are, and Coco was incredibly athletic at 10 already. Um, and I look at how driven they are, how important that is for them to achieve what they want to achieve. Uh, I like people who are obsessed with something. I think everybody who did something great in life are completely driven in anything. So how driven they are, that's very important. And how much they believe in themselves, not in general. I think some of them are not incredibly confident people, but when it comes to their sport, they're incredibly confident in their ability to become great at what they're doing. And I think that's very, that's a key element because they're gonna have to face so many setbacks if they don't have this belief deep inside that they are special and that they're gonna make it, they're gonna give up. They're gonna have so many occasions to give up. So coming back to your resilience, yeah, that's something I really look at when, even at 10 you can see it. All right, that is a great note to end on. Thank you to Roberto, Tati, Patrick. I'm James Fleming with that week. Have a wonderful can, everybody.